Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton talks about efforts to build a new downtown sports arena and a debate on Proposition 123, which uses state land trust to settle an education funding lawsuit. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simon. State House and Senate leaders have come to terms on a nine and a half billion dollar budget. The deal includes giving Governor Ducey the tax cut he promised by way of business tax cut measures that work out to 26 million dollars. The deal also calls for more money for K-12 schools and universities than the governor had originally proposed. Overall, the budget would increase spending by 60 million dollars over last year and provide additional funds for child welfare. But the tentative deal does not restore the kids care health insurance program for low income children. A vote on the budget proposal could come in the next few days. Job cuts were announced today at two Chandler Intel factories. Intel announced last week that it was cutting 12,000 jobs worldwide. We now know that 560 of those layoffs will be at the two Chandler plants. The laid off workers will receive six weeks of pay and three months of health insurance. Phoenix based Freeport McMorrin says it will be cutting about 25% of its oil and gas workforce. That is the company struggles to deal with a $4 billion first quarter loss. The company will also look at selling certain interests in some of its assets. And another Phoenix-based company says it could sell its flagship property even if shareholders reject a deal to sell it to private interests. The Apollo Education Group told investors today that it might still move to sell the University of Phoenix even if shareholders reject a current $1.1 billion offer. Shareholders have until Thursday to make their choice known. Chasing the Dream is part of an ongoing public media reporting initiative that looks at the contemporary state of the American dream. Tonight we focus on a way to help people realize that dream, education. On May 17th, voters will go to the polls and decide on Proposition 123, the Arizona Education Finance Initiative. The measure would increase education funding by $3.5 billion over 10 years, but there is concern over just how that money will be paid. Arizona Horizon producer Elisa Adams and photographer Langston Fields take a look at the numbers and the arguments for and against Prop 123. To understand how Arizona helps fund education, you have to go back more than 100 years. That's when the federal government granted Arizona more than 10 million acres of land. The catch? Any money made from the sale or lease of that land had to be put in a trust primarily to fund education. Over the years, that fund has grown to about $5.2 billion. That's a lot of money, even by government standards. But schools only get a portion of that every year. So the distribution right now is 2.5% of the total net asset value, not just how much we earn, but of the total net asset value each year goes to schools. Under Proposition 123, the amount of money distributed from the fund for students like these will increase from 2.5% to 6.9%. And that number, 6.9, is one of the things that has opponents and supporters of the proposition at odds. Senate President Andy Biggs, who supports Prop 123, believes the trust can handle the increased distributions. Yeah, in fact, based on current value with current trends, you should actually not only be able to pay for that distribution every year, but you should actually increase the corpus or the principal amount so at the end of 10 years, you will have added anywhere from $500 million to $750 million. But State Treasurer Jeff DeWitt, whose office controls the fund, says the higher distribution rate will decimate the trust over time. Well, 6.9 is too high under any circumstances because you have to add in also inflation, which means we have to make almost 10 percent, a 10 percent return just to, to not be touching principal. The numbers can make even the best students head spin, but the treasurer says it's simple math. One estimate shows the fund should average an annual rate of return of about 6.3 percent. Subtract average inflation and you get about 4 percent. So according to this math, you could give schools up to 4 percent of the fund every year and not cut into the principal. DeWitt thinks something closer to that rate is a better plan. 
we can go up to 3.75%. It would not be included in Prop 123. I keep saying, let's run a separate measure, go to voters, let's bump this up 50%. Senator Biggs argues that the lower distribution rate doesn't take into account the fact that the fund has been shorting these students, giving out just 2.5%, for many years. He says that left a lot of money in the trust that should be distributed to schools, not kept for future growth. Aren't we then saying that we are underfunding current beneficiaries in favor of future beneficiaries because uh, maybe you should be uh, reducing the amount of growth in your savings account? Senator Biggs also says the trust will grow as more land is sold over the next 10 years, adding to the principal. But what happens, warns Treasurer DeWitt, if the stock market has a down year and you've given away all the surplus in the trust? He says you'll have to cut into the principal to pay out the 6.9 percent. Then you need the peaks to fill in the valleys because there are also going to be years where the market doesn't return that much or the market might go down. We all know the market goes down. And in those circumstances, the only way we're able to pay that 2.5 percent, even in the case of a market decline, is because we have these other years where we take the peaks to fill in those valleys. Back in the 1900s, when the state land trust was set up, no one could have imagined it would one day be worth billions, or what its impact on today's students might be. But Prop 123 will affect future generations. Now voters have to decide if that impact is good or bad for the kids who will sit in these classrooms 10, 20, maybe even 100 years from now. Besides increasing the distribution rate from the state land trust, Proposition 123 also gives more money to schools from the general fund. If passed, overall spending will increase by about $280 per student annually. Here now to debate Prop 123 is Andrew Morrill, president of the Arizona Education Association and a supporter of the measure, and Morgan Abraham, who is leading the campaign against Prop 123. Good to have you both here. Thanks Thank for you. joining us. Why is Prop 123 good for Arizona? Because we finally changed the course uh, that's been in the wrong direction for years. Frankly, we have sent an unwelcoming message to educators, not just our teachers, but the folks that keep campuses and students safe and orderly, uh, that they're not valued, that their work is no priority in Arizona. Voters should be credited with raising the education funding issue to the number one priority in this conservative border state. It's very clear that voters created this victory, created this moment. We've got to do something to stem the absolute exodus of teachers and people leaving schools. We've got to do something for the students in our classrooms right now, over a million of them. We can have this win, and we can leverage this win into other wins very soon. Why is Prop 123 bad for Arizona? That was great, but it didn't really talk into any of the actual details of Prop 123. When you look at Prop 123, we call it the three T's, triggers, trust, tax cuts. It adds triggers to our Constitution that limit funding for education forever, not just in the 10-year term of 123, but forever. It depletes the land trust so future students and teachers, and this includes teachers, get less money for education forever as well by $100 million a year. And then this is clearly a ploy to cut more taxes. They're artificially funding education out of the land trust so they don't have to touch the budget surplus of the capital so they can cut taxes with that money. Pick a T. Pick a T and go. He's got three well, things. Well, but, but they're all the same T, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Listen, the no vote, no matter where it comes from, hurts teachers just as bad, and it joins the ranks of no votes for the last 15 years that have kept salaries the lowest across the country, kept per pupil funding the lowest in the country. There's no difference between a no vote that does harm from somebody who claims to have good intentions and then puts his foot down on the backs of teachers and says, guess what, my no is okay, even though it's going to have the same effect as every other no you've felt. Respond, please. So we have, I mean, teachers all over the, the state that's, that are against one, two, three, and obviously they're not against one, two, three because it's not bad for education. They're against one, two, three because this is literally the ball game for, for education in the state. Public education in the state. If one, two, three goes through, we will get less money forever. We also have a teachers union that's, that's on board with us. And this is not, by voting no for, for on one, two, three is a vote for education. If you are okay with spending future teachers and, and children's money now, instead of using the budget surplus, you should vote yes. But if you want to push the legislature to spend the money that they have on education without putting f the future at risk, vote no. Fa people argue that failure, if this goes down, goes back to the courts, 
uncertain outcome. Teachers don't get raises. Districts are already budgeting for the raises. A whole deck of cards goes flying across the room if this doesn't get passed. Sure, so this goes down May 18th. Our state treasurer, Jeff DeWitt, has promised to petition the judge to, to settle this lawsuit based on what we call the DeWitt plan. We have so much money in our budget surplus, even more money than the JLBC and the legislature knew about because tax day just happened. It is ridiculous that we're proposing to spend future generations money instead of just spending the money we already have sitting in the account. So this is an easy thing to settle. This is not hard. When we made Prop 123, that was, we were at a time when we didn't have this budget surplus. You know, we have the budget surplus now. Let's settle the lawsuit we, and get back to paying. Ted, that's not correct. We had a budget surplus. We didn't have the votes and Jeff DeWitt doesn't either. He only lacks two things really to make his DeWitt fantasy come true. One is viability in the current legislature and the other is really the legal mechanism to make it happen. He's named as a defendant, but this is really just a ploy. What we have to focus on is the impact that a no vote has. It defies all logic to suppose that you can prove your commitment to education funding in front of a already conservative legislature by saying we're so committed to education funding that we turn down $3.5 billion. We will start worse than ground zero. We will start in a trough and then expect a legislature to come around magically because so, we all want that to happen. It sounds like you're admitting how bad one, two, three is for the future, but you're just basically saying that there's no other way Actually, forward. Actually, the that opposition kind of is based on two complete mistakes. One is that by voting no on one, two, three, we prove a commitment to education funding. And the other is this magic that supposedly is going to happen if we either go back to court, those of us who were actually involved in that, and you were not, with all due respect, know that there's a dead end there, or that we're gonna magically produce results in our November election that we haven't produced in the last 14 years. Our, that's actually a deception visited on our teachers and our students that we can't afford. But you're saying that this is a bad thing. You're just afraid of what happens if we vote no and then Actually, I haven't forward. said that at all. It is the necessary critical first step. So you're using step. words like necessary, and we it need is, it. Is, is Prop 123 a good thing critical, for the future? It absolutely is. What I need you to do, Morgan, is take a look at these salary increases right here. I want you to circle for me the districts that you don't think deserve a salary increase right now. Yeah, so These are agreed. I'll, now, wait a second. I'll stop. My mom's These actually a teacher. Are so agreed my upon family salary increases feels this more than most families. These my are mom agreed upon a, salary you know, increases if one, two, okay. three passes. So so which let ones let do you so think my we should mom not is have. a teacher. So my and family, I was a teacher for my family feels years. this more than ever. All we are saying is we live in a in a in a state where the the constant budget uh, constant tax cuts have just keep going and going and going and by passing prop 123 we are allowing that to continue prop 123 you are spending, pays teachers you are right spending now the what money, they need most you're spending the and money of revenue. the future students and the future teachers and it doesn't belong to them right now but there's your an crystal easy, ball on what happens in 10 years is obscured by the fact that your crystal ball's been wrong so far you sang a doomsday prophecy about this session that's been incorrect so you like how do you expect us to believe what's going to happen in 10 years. You don't know what's going to happen in 10 years. And there's the contradiction. This is essentially the difference. The Prop 123 campaign, the pro campaign, puts people before policy. Morgan doesn't know the folks in our schools, and he's not shep he's not burdened with the responsibility to do what's right by them now. Respond, please. Yeah, I mean, you will not say anything about whether one, two, three is good or bad. You're using words like necessary. I've answered that absolutely. We have to. It I want to well, right look at some numbers real quick term, that I brought that please. we can kind of. So this is this is our operating money right now. This is straight from the treasurer's office. We have more cash on hand at this point in the year than we've ever had in Morgan, the history of this no state. And on top of that, so this, but this goes ever. back to the original point. Is I think what he's, what he's saying. Sure, and, and I get that. You're what selling he's saying a is, fantasy hold, to people. Andrew, hold on a second. What he's saying is the money's there. Passionate. The surplus is there. I mean, we could we could wind up having oh, yeah. phenomenal revenue. We have but if the legislature revenue. doesn't give it to education, it's not there. Right, and we're saying there's a path forward. We have the treasurer already on board. Obviously, we have a majority of the, the, the legislators there. They're waiting. You're not seeing legislators talk about Prop 123. They're sitting back and waiting because they know how bad it is, but they're not going to campaign for it. And the second this goes down, the, you have the education community, you have the treasurer, you have a, a, the majority of the legislatures. There is a budget that can be passed, and we can still cut taxes and do what the governor promised. This is our last, our last slide. This shows the budget surplus after we spend money on Prop 123. There's so much money in there we can spend we can spend the money on prop one two three from our budget like surplus and cut time. taxes it reads like a great story and it will completely skip over and once again deliver a no 
to the teachers and the students in our schools right now. There's not one funding argument that goes away right now if we pass one, two, three. But Does it bother you yeah. that this, we're basically, the argument goes, yeah. you're selling assets to let lawmakers off the hook for what they should have done and the courts said they should have done in the first place. We're balancing the needs of a million students right now in our schools with the needs of students in the future. Morgan has no ability to say what kind of funding mechanisms will be available in the future at all. He's got a kind of a shady crystal ball. But can you, but can you, what, what does your crystal ball say when there are triggers in this proposition that suggest that if education funding hits a certain amount of general revenue, all of a sudden cuts come back? That, the, 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 hang on back one second. Hold on, let him respond, please. The, uh, the triggers were part of the negotiation and the overall state cap is a mathematical reality only and a political fantasy. Budgets don't grow that way. There's been a lot made of that. An article in the paper today in the Capital Times came out and said it's unlikely we would ever hit that 49 percent. The only time we have was when we completely redid the funding formula. That's another part of the fantasy. Bottom line, this helps schools and teachers now. And we can still help schools and teachers now without stealing from the future. Yeah, and I, I want to talk not. about this 49% trigger real quick. We are a billion dollars away from where we were in 2007 when you factor in inflation. If we were to infuse some magic tax, a billion dollars into our budget right now, we would trigger that 49%. So what he's saying, by him telling you that we can never hit that 49%, he's telling you we will never reach 2007 levels of funding again. So if we put $500 million into our schools in a, in a future year, Morgan would turn that down. If Morgan had designed the pyramids, he would have built them from the top down. He's actually convinced himself that what could happen 10 years from now is more important than what's happening to our teachers and our students and our schools right now. We have a plan. I mean, it's, it's very Your plan obvious. plan is based the average, on fantasy. The average voter is going to look at this and say, you know what, I have kids and grandkids and I care about them just as much as I care about the students right now. Why aren't we using the budget surplus? Bottom line, Ted, no is not a strategy. No is not a promise. And it does not create the future wins this state needs. That's it. Got to stop it right there. Gentlemen, good stuff. Good to have you both Thanks. here. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Nice job. Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton joins us each month to discuss city issues, including a push to build a new downtown sports and entertainment arena. Here now is Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton. Good Great to see, to you. see you. Good to have you here. Uh, you just finished your State of the City speech. I want to touch on a couple of things here. Downtown arena. Yep. Why is it necessary for there to be a new downtown sports and entertainment arena? Well, the reality is, is th the point I was making in my State of the City is that if we as a community decide we're going to build a new arena, the Coyotes are obviously out of their Glendale arena in one year. They don't have a future home. If we decide that keeping the Coyotes here uh, is important, obviously the Suns, I've spoken to the years, they're getting to the point where they're thinking about a new arena. It would be crazy for us to build two new arenas for two different sports franchises that if we're going to do this in the most fiscally responsible way, the, one that, the way that makes the most common sense, it would be to come up with a plan that would put both professional sports teams uh, into, into downtown Phoenix. So my commitment that I made during the speech was that uh, if we move forward, we should move forward with two teams under one roof instead of two different arenas. That makes no sense. And obviously do so in a way in which we don't raise uh, taxes. The only funding source that I would support is the existing sports facilities fund, which is a, a, a 
tax on car rental and hotels. So it doesn't affect it's, current it's residents. A, it's, a, it's a tax, but not against residents. Against uh, mostly visitors. visitors. And there is an existing uh, opportunity to, to utilize that. So I won't support any new taxes uh, for, an are, for an arena. And I wanted to get that out on the table. I wanted to be honest with people and say that uh, this is the approach I think is smartest for this community. It doesn't make any sense to have two new arenas uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this valley. Who would run the arena? Well, that, that's all subject to negotiation. So, so that you're, ideally, who would run the arena? Oh, that's uh, again subject. I don't want to prejudge who may run the current arrangement. Obviously, is that we have an agreement with the Suns to run the arena. They are a primary partner. They've been an outstanding partner with the city of Phoenix for many years. They helped to revitalize our downtown. I mean, we've got a lot of great things going on in downtown with arts and culture and Roosevelt Row and great restaurants. There's a real excitement that's going on, and part of that has been the decision of. Uh, the Suns to invest in our downtown uh, years ago. I value that partnership. It is an important partnership uh, to the city of Phoenix, and I want them to continue to be our long-term partner. But any of the details, mm -hmm. I shouldn't be talking about it on television because that really is the subject to negotiation. Indeed, and that's going to be pretty touchy negotiation because the Coyotes want what they want, the Suns want what they want, Mercury wants what they want, and uh, it's a juggling act there. Is it not? Well, I'm a big Mercury fan, so whatever they want, they're going to get. Uh, yeah. that, no, I'm just joking. Uh, in all seriousness, look, uh, you show me a arena negotiation around the country that's been easy, you'll show me the first one. These things are never easy. I felt as the leader of this city, for me to come forward and say, I don't want the Coyotes negotiating for some deal uh, for a new arena, and then in a couple years, the Suns negotiating for a new arena. If we're going to do this, let's... I'm going to set those parameters. For me as mayor, the parameters are, let's try to do one arena for the Suns, Mercury, Rattlers, and the Coyotes, and all the of the Rattlers, hundreds yeah. of other events uh, that go along with having a state-of-the-art arena in downtown. And let's do so in a way in which we don't raise Why? taxes. That's my parameters. Why can't they all share what exists right now, Talking Stick Arena? Well, uh, as you know, the Talking Stick Arena was not made for uh, NHL uh, hockey. So the hockey team realistically can't make that their long-term home. Maybe maybe their short-term home, frankly, uh, as a way station, as a new plan for a long-term plan for the Coyotes is being uh, is being made. But again, this is never easy. Uh, these are, these arena uh, uh, agreements around the country have always been difficult negotiations. I want to do so in a spirit in which I'm honest with the people of the city of Phoenix. I'm honest with the ownership groups of the uh, sports franchises and say, here's my parameters so you know going in what you're dealing with. I think that's what, uh, that's what I should be doing as mayor. Critics say, let these owners pay for these arenas themselves. You say? Well, in a, you know, in a perfect world, that, that would be the case. Uh, but realistically in Phoenix, if we want to maintain our teams downtown, bring on new excitement, new people, new events like NHL uh, hockey and, and potentially other uh, uh, entities as well, in addition to keeping our arena at the cutting edge for all of the best concerts and other family-friendly activities, the hundreds and hundreds. Remember, this arena gets used 200 nights a year. I want it to be used close to 300 nights a year. I mean, I want downtown Phoenix to be the center of life uh, in the um, uh, in the valley of the uh, of the sun, I, I won't use any new taxing sources, so I will not uh, put any new additional uh, taxes. The issue is whether we would use the sports arena fund, the sports facilities mm -hmm. fund for sports facilities, and I think that would be the logical uh, the logical choice. Real quickly, what happens to Talking Stick Arena? Oh, that's still also also the subject matter of uh, of discussion. So there's no existing plan for what would happen to the future of that uh, of that arena. Obviously. Because downtown development is doing so well, the city owns that site. It is a city of Phoenix uh, property, and regardless of whether the arena is there or not, we will own that asset and it'll be used for something beneficial to the people of Phoenix. In your address, you uh, talked about the state legislature. Your quote was, continues to wage war on cities. Explain. Well, uh, you, if you follow the legislature at all, and I know you do, and I know the people watching this television show uh, do as well, it's a highly educated uh, audience that uh, watches Horizon. So they know that bills have been passed uh, that threaten to take away state share revenue from cities if we pass laws that don't fit within what I described as the narrow ideological box of our state legislature. Now, state share revenue uh, is a term that may not may not everyone understand. It's basically money that we used to pay police officers and firefighters. The vast majority of our budget goes to public safety. If you cut revenue from the city, uh, you're cutting revenue for police officers and firefighters. And it's, it, they're threatening because the city of Phoenix has shown leadership on issues like human rights, 
uh, issues like sustainability, because we probably we acknowledge that climate change is real and we're trying to do something about it that may be different than the the priorities or values or beliefs of the state legislature. We're trying to advance our city and we do so in a way that doesn't fit within that narrow ideological box. All of a sudden we're threatened to lose revenue for police officers and firefighters. Uh, that's not good for the state of Arizona. It's certainly not good for the city of Phoenix. And that's why I, uh, I said to the legislature, don't work against us, work with us. We're doing great things. The legislature though says that it, it, you can be doing great things, but if you're doing one thing, Mesa's doing another, Tucson's doing this, Prescott's doing that, there's a patchwork of laws and regulations out there. Even some folks on your council are saying this. It doesn't make good business sense to have a patchwork of regulations around the state. Valid? No. I mean, if City of Phoenix wants to show leadership, as we have in protecting, let's, for example, lesbian and gay residents, we have a very strong non-discrimination ordinance. We have a value system in the City of Phoenix, which is, we don't want anyone to be discriminated against. We want people to, to, from all walks of life, all backgrounds, to feel welcome in our community. One way of doing this is to have a comprehensive non-discrimination ordinance. Tempe's done the same thing, Tucson's done the same thing. Those cities have shown leadership. Just because that doesn't fit within the narrow ideological box of state legislature, that's actually a great thing for the, then, for the, uh, for the community because there are a lot of companies, advanced companies in technology, offering high wage jobs that only want to come to communities that have a value system similar to theirs. So it actually is an economic advantage to have a leader, a leader city like the city of Phoenix. Indeed, uh, that could make some would agree with you and that seems to make some, some sense of sense here, but the legislature does control the state and the cities are part of the state. And if the legislature says X and you want Y, they're saying we're going X. Well, I would say that if if the people of this community want the city of Phoenix to adopt the exact same value system as the uh, state legislature, uh, they haven't followed Phoenix politics for a, a, a long time now. We've taken a leadership role on economic development. Phoenix is leading the way on economic development. I mentioned in my speech, uh, the unemployment rate when I started was 8%. It's now down to 4.6%. The choices we are making are the right choices. Phoenix has a better credit rating than, than the state of Arizona. We go about our business in a very smart uh, way. And we want to lead on human rights and sustainability and supporting our veterans. And we, the, the legislature should embrace that they have leadership uh, cities, knowing that there are going to be companies that are looking for cities like Phoenix to, to go in where they may not want to go into uh, cities that don't share those uh, values. So look at us as an advantage to have a city like Phoenix, not a disadvantage. All right, we got to stop you right there. It's good to have you here. Always good to be Thanks on. Thanks for praising my audience. It's always a good thing. They're, they're intelligent. All right. They're all strategic. Right. They're, all right. they're great looking people, Horizon Watchers. Uh, that uh, is it for now. Watchers. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by the JPB Foundation and the Ford Foundation.